Hello, and welcome to our roundtable guests and to our online audience. My name is Anne-Marie Pena, and I'm Head of Culture here at the London Borough of Barking and Dagenham. We're delighted to host this event today in our council chamber here in Barking Town Hall in the London Borough of Barking and Dagenham. Our event today marks a really special moment. It's the digital launch of our new town, of, of new town culture. Um, make sure you explore our website, which you can find at www.newtownculture.org, and check out the many resources, which include podcasts, tools, and projects. To those of you online, um, you can field your comments and questions to us by tweeting, and that tweet address is at newtownculture underscore, or you can comment in the YouTube links. At 3.10, we will pass on comments and questions to our speakers from our online audience, so do put any questions or comments that you have in the comment box. Um, our event will finish today at 3.30, and it's made possible through the generosity of the Mayor of London, through funding from the London, uh, um, London Borough of Culture, Culture, Cultural Impact <laughs> Award, and our Young Londoners Fund. It's also made uh, possible through the generous support of Borough of Barking and Dagenham. I'm delighted now to introduce uh, Councillor Ashraf, who's our Deputy Leader of the Council and Cabinet Member for Community Leadership and Engagement. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so it's great to welcome you all in person and also online for this conversation, which is part of uh, the groundbreaking project New Town Culture. So New Town Culture uh, started in 2018 to connect art and culture with social care services. Rooted in Barking and Dagenham, New Town Culture commissions art that is embedded within the vital work of social care. In, a, in an exciting um, development, New Town Culture is building an ethos of creating social work through a new master's accredited course with Goldsmith University in London. Through an incredible program of artist projects alongside council services with young people and adults, we have seen our residents build independence, confidence and knowledge. Artists such as Lady Unchained developed lyrics with our youth uh, offending services Sound um, artist Emma Smith created pieces with unaccompanied asylum uh, seeker children. And Albert explored art and self-care through nails, nail art uh, with young women at risk of exploitation. In 2022, we will launch a series of four new artworks developed <coughs> um, uh, with the Serpentine Galleries are, um, as part of the project Radio Ballads. The new works uh, brings artists into the frame of care and social work, uh, exploring issues such as domestic abuse and end-of-life care. This event marks a pivotal point for new town culture. Today we launch a new website um, and a whole raft of tools for social care staff and creative practitioners. You will find a creative self-care tool and brand new set of resources by Tate for social workers. We are committed to innovation in the culture field and are on a mission to bring culture practices deep into the everyday work of public services. Today, we talk about one of the key theme of new town culture, hopeful disruption. In many ways, Newtown culture is a perfect example of this, bringing art at the core business of social care. So we look forward to the conversation. Welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashraf. I'm pleased now to introduce <coughs> the chair of our conversation today, the brilliant Mariah <coughs> Steedman, <laughs> curator of Newtown culture. Uh, Mariah set up Newtown Culture in 2018. Uh, before that, she was a curator at Create London at Whitechapel Gallery in Tate. We're very, very lucky to have her here. She edited also the book Gallery as Community, 
art, education and politics. Over to you, Marika. Thank you. Right, hello everyone. It's lovely to have you all here today. Hello to everyone at home. So, today we're excited to bring together an eclectic mix of social care professionals, uh, people with care experience and uh, artists, and we're here to talk about the world of social care, art and creativity. So, if I just start off by saying, to get us going, I think New Newtown Culture demonstrates how these two sectors have much more in common than we might expect. They both share the impulse to play a part in social change, uh, that, that impulse is often shared by artists and social care practitioners. Both focus on important questions about relationality and relationships. Both often question power and agency, and both are often entrusted to communicate the stories and experiences of others. But these worlds are rarely aligned. One is labelled as being guided by statutory responsibility, the others get guided by this idea of being free, creative freedom. But what happens when we work together? Uh, so the dream pot potentially is, can we see creative approaches being embedded in training, supervision, direct work in social work? So sharing a knowledge across these sectors can support social work potentially to be more ap empathetic, more caring, uncover knowledge about people's needs, build new relationships, support change and shift fixed narratives for service users. So, Newtown Culture has to try and help this relationship across these two sectors. We've identified five areas where we see the overlap to be most explicit and one of these areas is this idea of hopeful disruption. Um, so basically, does creativity, uh, does being creative and challenging protocols make sense as a strategy to support the best outcomes for users of social care services. So today we're joined by very wonderful, knowledgeable eight practitioners here around the table today. Um, so we're going to talk for 60 minutes and then as Anne-Marie said, we will present questions from our audience out there. Uh, so please feed in your comments and questions on Twitter and on YouTube. So now, without further delay, I'm going to introduce our wonderful panel. So first here, we have Luke Rogers. And uh, Luke Rogers is founder and director of The Care Leaders, a lived experience organisation who engage, inspire and support transformation in children's services. It's good to have you here. Thank you very much. Here we have Marley Starsky-Butler. And Marley is an artist with a concurrent practice as a social worker. He says this enables him to be a jigsaw piece in ensuring children in care have the best possible futures. Welcome, Marley. And then moving across, we have April Bald. Now, April has been a social worker for 32 years. <laughs> Amazing. And has been operations director for Children's Care and Support in Barking Dagenham for the last three. And she's responsible for all our statutory children's social care services in Barking and Dagenham. Welcome. Thank you. And moving around to Sarah. So Sarah Boozy is a practitioner at PAUSE. Uh, which is an intense relationship-based programme which works with women who've experienced or are a risk of repeated removals of children from their care. And Sarah has worked in social care for over 20 years in adult and children's settings, including family group, group conference. Welcome. Moving round to Vicky. Um, Vicky is uh, the Social Work England Regional Engagement Lead for London and is a registered social worker and she's worked for 20 years in adult services. Um, and now moving around to Claudia. So, um, da -da -da, Professor, I couldn't find you because <coughs> I couldn't spot the word professor. <laughs> 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 professor Claudia Bernard is Professor of Social Work and co-head of the Department of Social, Therapeutic and Community Studies at Goldsmiths University of London. Fantastic to have you here. You. And then we have Gail Chong Kwan, who is an artist. She creates large-scale environments that are often cited in the public realm and she's currently artist in residence in photography at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And then we come to Norma. Norma O'Connell is a social worker in the family support and safeguarding team in Barking and Dagenham Children's Care and Support. Welcome, Norma. Hello. 
Brilliant. So finally, we can hear you <laughs> speaking. <laughs> so as you know, today we're going to shape our conversation around some questions. I'm just going to open up with a really uh, a wide question, which is, can we reflect on what, what does the phrase hopeful disruption mean to you? So I'm going to zoom in on Gail. Is that all right, Gail? <laughs> like a scary teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go first. I'm happy. I'm happy. Um, I was thinking about it because I think <coughs> the, the word hopeful gives you a, a sense of that the disruption has a purpose. And I was wondering whether that's always true. And it might be more like a kind of hopeful attitude that you have rather than it having to lead towards something. And disruption can be something very simple. It can be things like in the project that um, I developed, it was with young women who were mothers, who their disruption was just having a sort of sense of a a space where their children could be looked after alongside where they could do creative activities. So the disruption can be something, hopeful disruption can sound very big and very kind of unwieldy, but actually it can just be a sort of disposition or an attitude and a small change mm -hmm. in a routine that could perhaps become a bit stuck. Absolutely, yeah. Does anyone else have another reflection on that idea? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, th I think it's about it's about challenging the sort of conventional ways of doing things, isn't it? And and um, I think I've read one of the quotes by one of the um, someone from from your organisation, Claudia, about it, it's inspired by hope. Mm. Yeah. And and I think that for me is is the core to mm. it is is mm. the you know the the hopeful disruption. Mm. You know, we often disruption and social care can have quite a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. Disruption of family life, um, you know, removing children, say for example, whereas actually we we sort of shifting that narrative, and coming in with you know social workers want to and, and child practitioners want to come in, in you know and disrupt the negative, but with a positive focus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's about using hope as the inspiration. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the, um, you know, the principle that um, we um, believe people can change and we mm -hmm. believe that um, and sort of breaking the sort of cycle. So that hopeful disruption, I feel, mm -hmm. fits in for me. That's where it fits in quite well mm -hmm. with um, like disrupting the norm for children. Mm -hmm. And the norm can sometimes be quite damaging, quite stagnant. And so maybe that sort of hopeful disruption, like um, going to the park or you know get them getting to mm. school every on time every day those little sort of little things mm. like and, and also big bigger things mm. like removing them from an environment and putting them in a more hope you know that, that that's mm. what it means to me i think it sort of fits in quite nicely in that that part of our principles mm. yeah mm. introducing new ceremonies isn't it yes. new opportunities yeah. that you know break away from some of the the more negative or fixed narratives i think you used that word earlier mm. yeah like yeah mm. So I suppose mm -hmm. maybe um, maybe it's good to think outside of this frame of social care and think about um, moments in the world when we know that positive disruption have triggered positive change. Mm -hmm. So that might help us feel more confident about thinking about it in the frame of social mm -hmm. care. So can we can anyone sort of bring to the table examples of moments in the world? Um, I, did you want to go first? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, <laughs> I can think of some obvious ones that are kind of big for everybody to know, but I think like hopeful disruption, just to go back to it, is like a bit of a mindset. So I think like disruption in social care can often be seen as something that's kind of scary. And I think that we are always trying in social care to do things better. And I think that's another pressure. We just, if things are not working, do things different. So in the way in which you do things different, if you can do that hopefully, mm -hmm. then one could argue that it, it's going to go in, a, in the right way. So then thinking about that as a mindset, how is times in the world triggered positive trend well, well covid mm. i think mm. before covid uh, the idea of for example facilitating things online for mm. social workers like if we just look at training maybe training was usually read some pieces of paper uh, do 10 mm. questions at the end of it and congratulations your diversity trend or your equality <laughs> trend <laughs> you know and the covid has kind of changed the mindsets mm. of people to be more accepting to things online and therefore online has become more creative in terms of how it facilitates mm -hmm. something as simple as training. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the mindset of a hopeful disruption. Mm -hmm. Someone looking at a negative space, which COVID most likely definitely was, and kind of saying, how can I be hopeful in this space and disrupt that so it's got positive change? Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's how I'd see those two things linking mm -hmm. together. Fantastic, mm -hmm. good example. 
Mm. Well, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Yeah, it kind of makes me think of, <coughs> in terms of the word disruption, kind of any type of like change or like activism. So any of like the rights or the things that we have now, at some point most people didn't have them. And something, yeah, so the, the status quo had to be disrupted by people being like, well, this is not great, and mm -hmm. fighting. So like any, f I just think of anything really, like anything, anything that I do in life that I can just, I don't really have to even think about now. If I was to like go to the history book and kind of go back some pages, it'd be like, well, at some point you couldn't do that. And a bunch of people mm -hmm. was like, we need to do that. So they really disrupted the status quo to try and like fight for mm -hmm. rights and things like that. So mm -hmm. it just brings me down to like activism and mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. everything really, <laughs> like all of it, all <laughs> events that have happened in the past and yeah. not, you know, hopefully will continue to happen because there's far more mm -hmm. things to disrupt mm -hmm. going forward, mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was thinking of something quite local to Barking and Dagenham. I can possibly mm -hmm. see where I'm going with the uh, Dagenham women in 1968 yeah. and yeah. the change that led to the equality mm -hmm. of labour. I can't remember the name mm -hmm. of them. The Equal Pay Act, Equal Pay, Equal yeah. pay Act yeah. got there yeah. in the end, yeah. and then the Equality Act. So, I mean, that was just one thing, but mm. it, it absolutely was a chain of events mm. that led to a change in lo legislation. And I mean, there's been so many examples along the way, but mm. I think mm. I just wanted to draw it back mm. to Varky and Dagenham. It's on the news this morning, wasn't, wasn't it? it? <laughs> <laughs> Claudia, what yeah. uh, I was, uh, was going to say more broadly, the question you posed about... Um, um, outside of social care, the thing that came to mind, the two things that came to mind for me was the Me Too and um, the Black Lives mm. Matter. Mm -hmm. And it's just rippled mm. Mm. across the globe in terms of... So bringing it back to social care, not so much the Me Too, but certainly Black Lives Matter, in terms of a lot of mm. the um, activities and work around race and anti-racism, that was, a, I think, that was a di direct result of the Black Lives Matter mm. movement, particularly from last year. So there are loads of examples, and I think for me, for the Me Too, um, what if we think back a few months ago with the survey that was done with girls in schools, mm. where they recorded their experiences of, of gender-based um, sexual harassment and misconduct. Um, that, again, uh, for me, was directly moved to some of the work that the disruption that the Me Too movement um, started. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I would say on both counts, it, it, it opened up more courageous conversations. Mm. And certainly we've seen social care children being brave and, and coming forward, mm. seeing other people being brave and coming forward and mm. talking about it. Mm. Um, and that sort of freedom, it's almost allowed freedom of expression, mm. which has come about a lot the activist movements mm -hmm. through the years. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the climate change and you know some simple little things that we're seeing in communities at the moment. I, I think I, I heard something the other day that there was a river bank that was being eroded and the local community got together and started to build sort of plants and trees to sort of try and ebb that, you know, that erosion. Mm. And that, that's sort of co a community <laughs> coming together, working together, mm. um, so making connections at a time where the everyone's been locked in, but also it's doing something good mm. for the environment. So giving hope that actually, our, you know, the river and, and the all the wildlife that live there is going to be protected now. Mm. So yeah. I think, yeah, the yeah, it's very topical at the moment as well yeah. for all the right reasons. And to build on that as well, just because, I mean, I work in the space of youth engagement which I think youth engagement is often seen in our sector as getting a young person along to a piece of training and sharing their life story. So we kind of have this kind of perception that young people can't get involved in decision make, in meetings where decisions are made, all that kind of stuff. But if you look at climate change and Greta Thunberg, which is you know an individual that's kind of said, actually, this mm -hmm. is uh, a, a really intelligent and articulate way to communicate something which has completely inspired and changed the whole world. So I think, again, with, with hopeful disruption, taking a, a larger example into our sector, you know, we work with young people, how can we get young people's voices involved in mm -hmm. our services mm -hmm. to inspire mm -hmm. uh, systems transformation as well. And I was thinking about the word, the sort of notion of the rupture in disruption, that a lot of the time it's actually bringing to the surface things that, like you were saying, have gone on. Mm. And sometimes that, that, that can be a role that, that we can play in as artists, that you sort of help with self-expression to bring to the surface, mm -hmm. things and inequalities and, and it lived experience and things mm -hmm. that they've, 
Yeah. Mm. It's like those moments sometimes that are building in communities, having a trigger point, and it might be an incident, it might be um, ac ac through an activist that mm. bring these issues that are within the communities mm. to a head that cause the change. Mm. Yeah. Mm. We, we have a duty, I think, to create those platforms, though, because, yeah. I mean, the fact is, especially if, like, young people, for example, trying to be heard, a lot of young people may think that they have to pursue activism to do that mm. uh, because the powers that be are not giving them the platform to do so. So, you know, another example of hopeful disruption would be to dissolve power uh, to young people, to allow mm. them to communicate and to give them the advice and expertise they need for grassroots solutions. And, and I think that we all have a duty to do that, to mm -hmm. actually just put them in positions where they can communicate that change rather than having to fight for it. Mm -hmm. We had an excellent example of that this last week, actually. It was our corporate parenting board. Yeah. So it talked about, you know, all for our children and care. And actually it was a takeover. So they chaired, mm -hmm. they ran the whole board, you know. So it was all sort of members were there and, and all, you know, mm -hmm. sort of managers, senior managers. And it was, mm -hmm. it was fantastic. You know, they had us drawing and playing different games. But actually in that we found we connected more and had more of a sense of our children, you know, yeah. Barking and Dagenham's children than we ever had from looking at performance reports and, you know, sort of the, the typical agenda items. So, mm -hmm. you know, and we're now going to change our board saying actually everyone needs to be in person with the young people leading it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah so example. we're quite excited mm. about that yeah. and, and they <laughs> were excited mm. by that response yeah. as well. Mm. So, yeah, good, good example. Mm. Mm. So, um, if I could just um, address this question to Marley and Gail. So, I feel really wrong saying that you're the only artist around the table because obviously we're all <laughs> probably <laughs> artists <laughs> in some shape or form. But, um, just wanted to ask you, so you have both worked with me on the Newtown Culture Programme and you've uh, worked in various ways. Can you touch on how what you've done for us felt disruptive or hopefully disruptive? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say um, the creative mentoring um, where artists were paired off with a looked after child. Um, and I'd say it was disruptive kind of hopefully disruptive in the sense of doing a piece of, like I've always worked with children and it's always been very, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like very much like outcome focused and very like time specific and things like this. And it was good going into a space where there was kind of freedom of that. And I got to go as kind of slow as I wanted and there wasn't as much pressure on the time spent with the child. Um, often you kind of you're going into a situation and you kind of like need to get something out of that situation. Mm. So it was it was really good to kind of have a space facilitated where you can work with a child and it can be quite open and they can direct it um, themselves and you kind of just facilitate that space yeah. with the overarching kind of value base that you want to kind of embed in them that they can. What the, what you want them to get out of it is to be able to use like creative tools potentially like in the future. So really just going in there to like plant mm -hmm. a seed that you might not necessarily see. And I think that's quite disruptive as a thing to do, to plant a seed that you might walk out of the room and then the seed, you know, the tree grows like two years later and you have no idea. Like that kind of doesn't sit within how you work with children or do kind of that kind of, you know, you go in with your tools mm -hmm. and then you're like, okay, I need to get this out of there. And you feel like a failure if you haven't like received, mm. <laughs> you know. <laughs> their life story and like mm -hmm. the hour that you've got to spend with them. So it's really nice and doing it quite slowly and just kind of seeing and being able to pick up on like little things. So I don't go too much into kind of what I did with, with mine, but. It'd be brilliant if you did, cause you did some brilliant <laughs> stuff with it, didn't but you? But there was just like some nuanced things. So like, you know, after each session, um, she would give me kind of like homework. Like I, there was like a film I had to watch and some music to listen to. And that's what I would like go and do between each session. And then when we came back, that was like the way of like opening up the session. And what were the films? Frozen. Ooh. Was it Frozen? <laughs> oh, no, I don't remember. Al Aladdin was one of them. <laughs> I don't remember. Aladdin was, was one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aladdin was one of them. But there was a there was like a theme at the at the first like four or five that she gave me. There was a theme, just to do with like you know all the family structures within those films were all mm. broken. Mm -hmm. So it was just something just mm -hmm. to, co it was like a really, like a nuanced way to kind of like work with that. Cause you know, mm -hmm. there's a reason 
there's a reason why you like the things that you like. And whether she knows that or not, she's not probably not sitting there thinking, oh, I'm going to watch the films that are like with the broken family. <laughs> yeah. But there's a reason, there's like a re- there, are, there are like reasons. And if you can work with people kind of like long term, then it is, yeah. it's good in that way. Yeah. Um, but that can, that can be, I can see how that can be frictioned a little bit with like solution focused things and outcome focused things because you can't see it straight away. Sometimes it's harder to justify it. Mm. So that's where the hopefulness comes mm. in because, you know, I really believe in that. I think there is a big justification mm. for it, but yeah. Mm. I think mine, rambling. F- mine felt this <laughs> rambling's great. Um, rambling's disruptive, isn't yeah, it? Particularly in, in a setting <laughs> like this. So I, I think we should ramble away. Um, I think mine felt disruptive because sometimes there's kind of very large elephants in the room when you're an artist or, or when you're a young person and you're trying to access things. And the big elephant in the room for myself and the young woman was, was, was being a mother. Mm. And they were very young women, and I'm <laughs> not a very young <laughs> woman at all. <laughs> but they had very young kids with them. And actually, one of the things was kind of taking away the idea that we're some sort of separate artist or something or whatever we are. Mm. And actually, we're people and we've had our struggles and our things mm. to get, and this is how we cope with this. And what I did was really focused around particularly within the sort of tail end of a particular point in the pandemic of how they find a space when they don't maybe ha- have a physical space in the house to get some head space mm-hmm. and that creativity can be a way of doing that and sort of sharing my experience so you slightly try to disrupt the mm-hmm. hierarchy or some kind of fixed definition of what you are and mm-hmm. it was very hus- hospitable because a very large part of the focus, as with a lot of my projects, was around lunch. <laughs> 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 and making sure that they got, you know, the care that was given um, by your team as well, to make sure that they arrived there in a comfortable way with their children, with the crash set up. What do they want for lunch? Mm-hmm. You know, who doesn't think about what you're going to have for lunch mm-hmm. is one of your pleasures. of, And that sort of hospitality felt um, lovely and sort of dis- disruptive in, mm. a, in, a, in a little way. Mm. Mm. It's funny actually because when I'm working out budgets for my project about disruption, I probably put way too much budget on in the food section <laughs> of my budgets, but it's incredibly, it a incredibly yeah. important, isn't it? It makes a huge difference. Yeah. I believe, yeah. Um, Can I respond to that? Yeah, yeah go no, because no, yeah, um, no, I think I think f- I mean if you want to just talk about Maslow's hierarchy, foods foods down there. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but th- th- there is. Th- They've both said two things, which is uh, which I look at as an inherited systems and culture, because we inherit these cultures, don't we, in these systems. So we inherit the kind of six sessions of CBT, young person, and you're going to be fixed. <laughs> and what you're saying is that you know you're giving them ownership of that session, and that in the future they may look back at a moment in that session, mm-hmm. um, which will then give them some insights into you seeing them in a different way and supporting them. So lots of young people that have gone through trauma are not ready to kind of receive. Mm-hmm. The, the the things that we say they should have, like therapy, you're kind of saying, well, let's just have a space and explore it together. Later in life, when they look back on those moments and they see people trying to force them through CBT and then yourself saying, hey, let's just hang out. It's those things that will make a big difference in their life. And I think it's important for practitioners to recognize that because you said as well about you want feedback from your work because that validates that you're doing a good enough job. Um, yeah, and I think there is a mind shift to change that we need to have that we can say something now that can be transported to the future. Mm. And, and it was the same around the, what you were saying around kind of how you define group work and how group work um, should, should be done. And again, around lunch, uh, you know, the amount of training and sessions that I go to where lo- we don't have a budget for lunch just tells mm. people you don't value them yeah. enough that they're mm. not going to eat. Um, and, 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 you know, it's like, yeah, you're going to starve, actually. And, uh, yeah, and, and, and there's a space in that way where, where you can actually have, you know, around the dinner table, around food. It's like the social worker driving in the car when you're looking forward. The focus isn't anymore intently on one thing. And a, a lot of, I call that stealth consultation, a lot of the things can just come from that that mm. you can just yeah. lead from. So. And things like food can be an incredible sort of sideways way into talking mm. about mm. cultural things. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. I find it a very rich and delicious way to oh do yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah, you yeah. just find fascinating people because someone <laughs> might be like, oh, I don't like cheese. You'd be like, oh, <laughs> you don't like cheese. <laughs> and I was just thinking about, you know, the training, sometimes when you're on training and there's no lunch and they, s- and they just kind of like basically open the doors of the industrial um, box you're in and say like, just offend for yourself. And say, yeah, it's very, <laughs> it is very, um, um, I think it is very important and about, yeah, feeling valued. Yeah. Um, and um, what were you talking about, girls, like young mums being looked after? 
I think that that um, some of them might not would might not have never experienced that mm. before, but mm. ever. Mm. Um, even like very simple things like someone welcoming them, someone being prepared for them, someone, and I think that on its own can be very important. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, you said something, sorry, just quickly, because I just remember you said something really important as well about kind of like how other people have got experiences that lived, ex like young people in care will have also gone through. And I remember doing a project in a school um, which was around anti-bullying because children in care were being bullied. So they were like, let's put all of the kids in care in the assembly hall and you're going to do a project with no. them. <laughs> and we were like, because that, but that's, that's how the funding stream works yeah. for the people yeah, premium, yeah. just work with the young people in care. So we said, no, what we'll do is we'll do an anti-bullying project for the mm. whole school and we'll mm. ask the school who gets bullied and everybody gets bullied. And they made posters, they made films, all sorts yeah. of stuff and it completely eradicated bullying from the school. But the, 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 height, the systems that we inherit would say well, that funding mm. goes to children in care, so you just work with them. Mm. So, you know, b by accident, you actually segregate that, that group because mm. the systems in play mm. suggest that that's what mm. we need to do. So, again, there's disruption around that mm. space. Around how, how do you bend those rules to say, OK, well, actually, let's use people premium in a better way and let's involve more young people in that space. It's got, you know, further, f it, it makes it better outcomes all around. You, you're working with a lot more young people, which is helping everybody then have the discussion that it's not just children in care that get bullied. Everybody gets bullied. Mm. Like mm. everybody goes through trauma. It's just that when you come into care, that trauma gets spotlight mm. and put on it. And, mm. and when you're not in care, it doesn't. Mm. So. I think all, all three, for example, it, it's about not going in there with a preconceived, this is what we've got to figure out and this is what we've got to hear back or what we're aiming for. And I'm, I'm just thinking about those, uh, the food, um, if you stick with the food mm. bit, um, family group conferences, you know, we, we try and get different family members together to uh, help us solve a problem, you know, of who's going to look after a child if, say, mum's unwell. Mm. And, you know, as a social worker or, or practitioner, you, you want to go out of that family group conference with somebody, Auntie Flora, going, yes, I'll take them and let's, mm. and, and then you think, great, all sorted out. But actually, you know, that might not be where that family's at. And, and mm. absolutely, the lunchtime, when you step out as a professional and leave the family mm. to come together over food, it breaks down some of those barriers. Mm. It's time to relax. It's also <coughs> time some of them have been together for the first time in ages. And actually, they sometimes come up with just maybe a little bit of a plan that mm. goes a long way. But also what they've done is they've come together and that what the child sees there is all these family members who some of them I didn't even know actually do care about mm. me. So it's it might not be mm. you've got your care plan all sorted and mm -hmm. done and dusted after those few hours, but you know, they've they've there's mm. other things that have come mm. out of it. It's a bit what you were saying mm. so in yeah. terms of don't go in there with a fixed mm. this is what I gotta get out of mm. it. Let the it's really interesting, mm -hmm. we can't really go into it now, but one mm -hmm. of the other kind of thematic areas that we worked out through Newtown Culture mm -hmm. that sort of connect creative practice and social care practice mm -hmm. is this idea of not knowing mm -hmm. and the fact that when artists are invited into these situations, we only give them a limited amount of information about the young people or the adults that they're working with. And that's not a luxury that social care practitioners have and actually not knowing is incredibly useful mm -hmm. in certain situations in terms of approaching mm -hmm. those people on their own terms in that moment. Mm -hmm. Anyway, one of the things I wanted to ask was, um, we've got a couple of social workers here from the borough who's, and some of their, the, their service users have been part of Newtown Culture projects. And I just wanted to find out how disruptive those projects have felt. Because I imagine that in some ways, I'm sure they've been brilliant. I hope they've been brilliant, <laughs> but I'm sure no. they've felt a little bit disruptive, maybe? Sarah, do you? Yes, in a yeah. really positive way. Yeah. Um, we were involved with, um, and are still involved with Radio Ballads. Um, that's um, a space that was created um, by the artists working with, with our women, um, particularly around things around resilience, um, resistance, uh, endurance and how we use our bodies and voices to express that. And I think particularly for our women um, who come with lots of narratives and labels around who they actually are, um, but particularly that come in with, with some difficult experiences, I think we had to be quite mindful about how that creative space was managed in a trauma-informed way. Um, and uh, the choices that the women perhaps had that previously they may have felt that if I'm in a space I have to engage within this process, thinking about that power and thinking about how they engage in those spaces 
And one of the themes that really came out powerfully was we came out with um, the sentence, I can say no. And actually, we found that conversely, they engaged in everything. Right. Um, so that was, that was really, mm. really That's positive. amazing. Mm. So that notion, that idea about saying no, yeah. is also something we should return to in a minute because that's very difficult for social care users to, to, to hold on to as mm. an option, isn't it? They often don't have that option. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. Norma, do you mm. mind? So some of your young people yes. took part in one of our projects, didn't they? Um, oh yeah, I was just um, thinking. So yeah, I had two sisters, and it was right when um, sort of lockdown was very. You know, the schools were shut down and things like that. And um, so it was wonderful for these for them to be able to get out and be in a different space, um, to be around other young people. And um, I think it really told me a lot about the family that I don't think I would have found out. Otherwise, in, t in, in a very positive sense. Sorry, your face went like that. that <laughs> 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 Don't worry, I'm not, I'm not going to disclose anything Thank about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, I, I sort of, I, there's a preconceived idea. Because of the background of the family, I just assumed that, that mum would be like, no, I don't want my daughters going to this place. I don't want, you know, I, I, you know. Um, and so I even showed them the flock, because it was like an um, artist was working with them to make poems or to make... Um, it Belinda Jarwin, yeah. yeah. And I was thinking that... And um, um, but she let them go and she drove them and she did the consent and she really wanted them and she said she wanted them to be able to do this because normally she would have taken them places for, you know, but she hasn't been able to because of um, COVID. And I don't think, I don't know if I would have found out about, found out that I would have, maybe I would have held on to that preconceived idea that she was a sort of parent who wouldn't have let her daughters do these sort of things. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm waffling or no, rambling no, a little bit, yeah. So I suppose it's back to that idea about um, about it giving, creating a space for you to have a different kind of relationship with your service users. So you saw that parent in a different way. 100%. Because it's not yeah. an opportunity you're usually able to kind of engage with them through, mm. no. I suppose. Mm. And mm. also I think it was, um, and I was able to, s it was nice for um, other professionals or artists or um, to, give me feedback and talk about these young, uh, you know, the, my young people from a different perspective mm. as well. Mm. I think that really, that mm -hmm. was really um, amazing. I think, yeah. Fantastic. So I remember what Beli one of the things Belinda did wha was she was focusing on poetry and writing, wasn't she, and spoken word. Mm -hmm. And so lots of the text that the young people wrote, the young women in that group wrote, I wondered whether those were also things that would be useful back in social work in terms of your uh, life story work or whether, uh, I mean, yeah. essentially she was practicing direct work with yeah, young people, yeah, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah. And documenting it without having to sit with a clipboard mm. and a pen, mm. pen and a paper. Mm. Maraka, can I come in on a couple of examples yeah, as well where yeah. I was particularly impressed with the program and uh, that was... Um, an area of our social work practice that's really close to my heart is I work with our unaccompanied minors and you know the, the group work you did with them bringing them together you know these young people have made mm. incredible journeys over here and you know we talk about trauma and often it's trauma we have no idea about and they're not able or willing or ready to talk about it so but that getting them together and then the it's the, was the connections they made with each other mm. that I thought was just so fantastic and and friendships that that could come out of that mm. and uh, you know in social work it's often um, and and youth fending work it's often about the the relationship with that one professional and we forget the, the value of group work mm. and you know good old mm. fashioned social work you know that I did back mm. in my originating country in South Africa we had to do group mm. work we didn't have you know caseloads were so massive and there's such a value there and, and I think we sometimes worry about GDRP too much and oh you know sharing information but actually that that meant the world to our young people mm. because they came here isolated didn't know anyone and they had that opportunity to mm. come together mm. and have similar stories similar experiences mm. somebody who looked like them mm. and mm. and you know they didn't sort of they could share and, and just mm. be and I think you did the similar work with the um, our foster carers Mm. and getting children and foster care all to come together and, mm. and just celebrate family and, and it's a different type of family and you know kids start talking about new new family that they had through that that opportunity mm -hmm. to connect 
Yeah. So I think that disruption mm. is, is about mm. connection and positive connections mm. that are outside just the, the normal professional relationship that we, you know, we often slotted into. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Having to just have. jumping in, actually, I mm. think in the context of COVID-19, that kind of sense of creating spaces to build a sense of community, particularly mm. for members of our society who may feel very disenfranchised or very disconnected mm. from the wider community, which was exasperated, obviously, by, by COVID. And there was something quite shared about that sense of loneliness and that mm. sense of... Um, but I think for those members of our community who may continue to feel that way for us coming out of COVID and being able to live um, and have that sense of connection, um, that's where, where the work is moving forward for us, is to continue to build and to put people in the spaces where they have those shared experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, the project yeah. you've been doing has been with the artist Helen Carrick, isn't it? Yes. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're starting to move to a point where you have you have a choir. Is that right? There's like is that That's the next bit, yeah. yeah. So we're we're using voices next. So um, we're really looking forward to that. So yeah. Mm, yeah really that exciting. will be the next mm. the next part. And we saw, you know, women who perhaps um, that you know, they might have a lot going on in their lives, they might have lots of things that are pulling and pushing them in different directions. Um, but we saw a really regular response and I think going back to that feedback feedback is sometimes with your feet feedback is mm -hmm. when you go back the next week and you're seeing faces like actually there's something valuable here for me mm -hmm. um, so yeah so yeah we're really looking forward to and we've got some new women so we'll be introducing them to the group that's mm -hmm. amazing mm -hmm. so um, okay so maybe thinking about why this work is so unusual so it's a shame that it is, but it is, this kind of relationship between creative sector and social care sector is super unusual. Mm -hmm. um, so really my next question is why? Why is hopeful disruption risky in social care? And I wondered if I could particularly ask Vicky from Social Work England and Claudia to reflect on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, that's okay. Um, I the first thing I thought about is risky to who, and uh, you know, is it you know who is so social care services are for the people who use them, and and if we're um, you know, developing this mentality of of risk averse mentality, then what are we stopping from happening? Perhaps, mm. of course, there are you know certain foundations within. The, f the structure, the legal structures, the policy structures, you know, it's around risk management, I'm not saying kind of lose risk, clearly, <laughs> I think that would get me lost. Of <laughs> but in, in, in a sense of, A, risk is always, is the, the res one has to manage risk, but one has to, but that's working with risk, not eliminating risk. Mm. And I think that's really important. And always keeping in mind, acceptable to whom? disruptive to whom and always having those people that are you know at, at the at the receiving end of social care services absolutely at the heart of all the work that we do it's not about making um the services I know nobody does this consciously but easier for organizations but it's about what is the outcome what is the what is the opportunity and what is the, um, the purpose of why we're in these roles and why we're doing pr producing these services. And just hearing about you know, these examples is really you know, it quite exciting and because it, it's about that outcome. It's about what are we looking for at the end. Mm. I don't know if that answered very <laughs> much, but anyway. Mm. Yeah. Claudia, have you got any reflections mm. on that? I think um, I think it 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 can be it can be perceived as being risky because it opens up the possibilities that people start asking more pertinent questions about mm. social justice and inequalities and the sorts of issues that contributes to people's experiences that brings them to the attention 
of um, social services, child welfare agencies. But I also think it's, it could be perceived as being risky because it's um, organizations and individuals can be quite defended and um, mm. particularly individuals here, very defended. Um, and being hopeful, you know, hopeful disruption requires kind of, you know, testing boundaries mm. and also play. For me, play, mm. play is very important, um, particularly for adults, playing, you know, um, and, and what that can generate in terms of how you think differently. So I think, I think it's it could be risky, perceived as being risky, because it opens up asking questions about mm. why is this happening to this particular group of people more than this group of people and the sort of social justice issues that are at should be at the core of social work and then it it requires you the individual to be not be defended mm. not to be you know closed up and defended and to be open to that tolerating not knowing mm. and and that's a very difficult thing to to work with i know you know having worked in in child protection work that not knowing i don't you know i can wait another day and not really you know those kinds of issues so i think it's i think it's complex um for me mm. I, I felt when i first considered the question i felt quite sad about it i thought why is it risky it shouldn't be you know good s good social work good youth offending work good child practitioner work is all about you know, being hopeful for a family and, and wanting things to get better for them and, and wanting to help them. Mm. You know, we are, our work in itself is we are facilitators of change. And, mm. you know, the good social workers do and, and youth offending workers do have a bag of crayons and mm. puppets and that mm. stuff mm. in their boots or their, their bags and, and always have. And, um, you know, have thought, actually, I'm not going to see this young person in the office because that just feels too informal. Where can I take them? Where can we go? Let's go and kick a ball around. So I think it's been there and those good workers who fill them. But it, 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 it's about what has happened in our work that has got in the way of that. And it actually, so I don't think it's risky mm. and I think it is absolutely acceptable. I think it's actually, sh it's mandatory. It's what our work mm. should be. And I know, I think Ali Monroe spoke about reclaiming social work some mm. time ago. It's that reclaiming that, that part of the job and yeah. just and being able to do it and realizing, I think, that practitioners, that we can do it and still do all the other stuff, you know, tick the boxes and fill out the forms because we yeah. have to do that. With, you know, we've got regulators who, <laughs> you know, for all the right reasons, <laughs> we have to do things in a certain way. But at the end of the day, that relationship and that risky work mm -hmm. and that the unknown or thinking the unthinkable or having conversations with families that nobody else dares to have, mm -hmm. you know, that that's the bread and butter. So it, it's just about reminding mm -hmm. ourselves and, and creating the culture and the platform for our mm -hmm. our staff to be able to do that mm -hmm. and our, you know, our colleagues. Yeah. 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 I, I always think about those young people who are really the ones at the margins, you know, those the ones that it's really difficult to mm. be in the room with them mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, and I'm talking about my experiences when I've been doing research with young people mm. um, in very difficult circumstances and just being in that group with them and thinking, oh my God, you know, <gasps> don't say this, don't tell me this, don't, mm. uh, maybe, you, you know, you shouldn't tell me this yeah. and thinking, what am I going to do here? Um, and also thinking, and all those, those, emotions the thing that are raised when we are confronted you know our own stuff mm -hmm. with regards to maybe I don't like that young person mm -hmm. they're too loud they're really you know in your face mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and all those kinds of complex emotions that we and I think that's what I meant about mm -hmm. probably being defended yeah, because absolutely. you don't want to mm -hmm. open that up mm -hmm. And we see that play out with child sexual abuse, don't yeah. we? Mm. You know, sort of not wanting to, to talk about it. And, and social workers almost being scared when a child does sort of say something and it's like, oh, what do I have to say next? I might, might get it wrong. I yeah. might disrupt the police investigation. Mm. All those barriers. Yeah. 
and just allow instead of just allowing that time I think you said it earlier Marley that time and space to have mm. at go at the young person's pace and mm. that's where it becomes risky because we do mm. have deadlines and mm. etc it, it gets into a s sorry, just gets into a space because and mm. there's a lot here isn't there in this mm. this is really m meaningful and conversation because it it's professional anxiety mm. I mean you you meet with a young person they communicate something we feel anxious for many different reasons one shall I say things the right way which is Munro also said mm -hmm. you know um, stop doing things the right way and start doing the right thing mm -hmm. and I think that's what we're saying here is that like um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <you> know, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> yeah 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 sorry I speak quick uh, but that's what it is isn't it it's like um, what we're saying here from what everybody's saying is that it's very important to find solutions to listen to young people mm -hmm. so they can communicate to us what's going on for them now when we're anxious, we want to feel safe. So how do we feel safe? We fall into the confines of our constructs, which are looked at children's reviews, for example. Now, is a professional meeting the right space for a young person to share their views of life? Um, that's, that's, that's for opinion mm. to be shared. But, um, so, so and that can be easily recorded as well. Um, mm. So when you start to use ownership over mentoring, art as a, as, a, as a mechanism for people to express, that's one that's kind of mm -hmm. your interpretation of what's going, how do you record that, when something happens, you know, where a young person discloses and you're an artist, mm -hmm. you know, how do you respond to that, because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, that's where it gets confusing, so there's, th there's a space that we need to create, mm -hmm. which, you know, accepts that young people are not just going to communicate with us through language and words in mm -hmm. meetings, but they're mm -hmm. going to do that creatively, and it's mm -hmm. like, you just need to watch Ken Robinson's speech on education that says, you know, young people are creative. And I think that mm. social care, like, like education removing creativity, I think social care somewhat removes humanity because it becomes process driven. Mm. And yeah. when we can fall into that too much, we, we can forget what the right thing is because mm. we're too focused on doing things th the, the right way. Mm. Absolutely. And I think just coming back mm. kind of from that regulatory viewpoint, but is absolutely agreeing with you, Luke, and thinking we need to think about outcome. Mm. And that we can get sometimes, of course, there are processes, you know, but we can get bogged down in them. Mm. And actually, you know, I've worked, I mean, social work England now, I have worked in um, inspectorate in the past. But, um, you know, again, I mean, I think it was what is the outcome? And, and I think sometimes people thinking that we're looking for things that we're not actually looking for because mm. it's always keeping those people those young people people i've worked with adults so the adults that i've worked with keeping them at the heart and, and explain, explain i did it this way because it worked for that person yeah, yeah. and, and, and Marley, did you want to say something sorry did you no, um yeah i was just gonna say just going off from what you said like it that's why there's a really good potential of like opening up like the team around the child like different types of professionals and opening up to yeah. that to artists to come in as well mm. Mm. to kind of like facilitate that space for play um mm. what you said because as i hear the word play i always think of um george clinton a wonderful human um from funkadelic and parliament and on the first album there's a line that says nothing is good unless you play with it mm. and <laughs> that's just been in ever since i heard that <laughs> when i was a kid like that's just like embedded in my head and it, it just it suits everything and i think within social work you kind of have to acknowledge where social work sits politically and in society and not to get too much into politics and things like this but in terms of budget cuts and things mm. like this and the capacity of social workers mm -hmm. um it's important that at the same time as thinking about different like ways of practicing as a social worker but not putting it all on social workers who don't at the t currently don't really have capacity to do much more than what they're doing and that's why you end up just coming back to your systems come back to your like your safety um because it's mm. safer in that way Whereas bringing in um, artists to be a team around the child and figuring out the best ways to do it. It's not just mm. about doing it. It's mm. like mm. there's work to do to figure out how mm. it can be best done. That then can facilitate a space for mm. positive play yeah. but alongside everybody else and it's to form a jigsaw puzzle. That, that, that's, that's interesting because the first piece of research I did with young people, with young, I, you know, naive. I just went along and thought I'll do a 45 minute interview, you know, and realise after the first one, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the second, the second time I did with young women it from very difficult backgrounds, and I, w I wanted to find out how did these young women living in gang, gang associated neighbourhoods, how do they keep themselves safe? And I kind of did a photo voice where I just asked them to take some photographs of mm. what, what some something that represents safety or being unsafe. Mm for them and we'll use that as a way to start a conversation mm -hmm. to talk about their exper their experiences. So it was that 
thinking, having to mm -hmm. think in a way to bring in play and to bring in something different to get people to talk mm. about their mm. experiences. I, I was just thinking that maybe that's one of the sort of core nubs of why what, what this I is about is so important because it's about the ineffable or the things that can't be said or written mm. that you can feel. And uh, it's really struck me when I've spoken to social workers about how they work, how creative, how they have mm ways of almost like they call it you call it props sometimes but it's not it's objects it's work yeah. it's mm -hmm. it's creative mm -hmm. artistic things that mm -hmm. you can bring and you know that thing disrupts a moment in it yeah. in a way and mm -hmm. you're working with the ineffable things that you mm -hmm. can feel an atmosphere in a room that's so mm -hmm. uncomfortable with a young person and that's why art has that ability Amazing. to bring out and to say you're already doing it you know, and to help yeah. bring it out further. Mm. And I think mm. that's the... Mm. I think that's exactly the message yeah. I was saying, that it good social work and, and youth offending work, it's happening. It is there, but it's just like, so, you know, we want to celebrate it. We want to make it part of our, br you know, bread mm. and butter and, and an mm. expectation as opposed mm. to it's just the few who do it. And it's, and uh, but, yes. but giving our workers the confidence mm. and the space to do it. You know, we've got two, two oh great God practitioners God. here to do that. I was that. just thinking, so when you mm. first asked the question, yeah. if we can remember back, you know, why is it risky? Yeah. Like selfishly, I was thinking about risky for me. Yeah. And there's all this like a catalogue of reasons why it's risky. I still want to be able to do it. And but um, so the r there's a risk of like the emotional labour mm -hmm. that you do. So um, actually, you know, like I think people have touched on it already. That like, say so sometimes you don't, I don't, I don't, you know, like you're risking your own um, sort of emotional well-being. Yeah. You're risking um, maybe sort of allegations because you're doing something that's a bit different, a bit unusual. If you're in the car with somebody, I don't know. So that's a risk always. Um, I'm risking being told off. Like, um, for example, like, you know, you've got, you know, what you spent three hours in a museum. When I'd there never tell you all for that. Yeah, <laughs> 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 I don't know, when this, 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 and this is over to you or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. using the word told off in a, <laughs> in a sort of general sense. It's the dashboard that tells you <laughs> Yeah, don't, shh, don't, don't <laughs> talk about the dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> But those, those sort of risks as a, a professional, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think it'll kind of more or less, everyone's more or less touched on it. So it feels it, yeah. like um, there's a kind of fracturing of the, 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 the intent. So the intent we have when we first go into this field as social work practitioners and uh, a fracturing between that initial drive and for some reason, from somewhere, the reality of that and something that is imposed on that situation. So what is it that's being imposed? Is it anxiety around statutory um, restrictions? Is it something about social work training? Like, where is it starting? Where, or where does the permission come from? I don't expect us to answer that, but it's a massive question. Everybody's seeking permission to mm. do this, aren't mm. they? Mm. But where does the permission come from? I wanted to echo, I see loads of creativity mm. in my colleagues. Um, but I think it's difficult because it's about what is the primary role for social workers. And I think that there is a pressure um, there to be wearing lots of different hats and to be have lots mm. of balls in the air and do it all very well. And I think, um, yes, is there room for creativity within our practice? Absolutely. But um, is there a necessity in the priority being to protect and that being the primary focus, yeah. um, particularly in frontline um, children's social work teams, there has to be that. It is, it is a necessity mm. that that yeah. is there. And, and thinking about how we include social workers, frontline social workers, in creative in that team around the child, so they are not just seen in that one-dimensional role, but yet not expected to be everything um mm. because mm. lots of social workers that i know want to be able to have that time but sometimes they do have to prioritize that and there has to be ne necessary mm. give a, mm. as to what they they focus yeah. on pa pa pause is an example of mm. hopeful disruption existing in our minds for years because it was funded by the innovation fund yeah. by dfe which was yeah. like five six years ago now yeah. so it's like mm. you know that all of those 56 projects that were funded all have got some um, aspect of like how do we do things creatively and what should mm -hmm. we be doing differently i think i think the question in terms i don't i'm not a social worker and I, i've got uh, no formal qualification whatsoever um but i work with social workers and foster carers and the only thing that i ever think or see commonly is the training and um i think goldsmiths are an exception because 
Goldsmiths, I think, are considered a radical um, in social work education. And I think that the concept of radical as well is interesting because when we're talking about creativity or using that, we can also see that as radical, which I think we should just change that. Mm -hmm. But what is it about when you're becoming a foster carer and you go through those 18 months of that you know, process to become a foster carer where you start off as like, I really just want to help children, I want to make a difference. And at the end of it, you're exhausted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you know, because it's because of how we communicate, what we communicate, what processes people have to memorize mm -hmm. and, and, and work to. And it's the same with social work. You know, social work, again, from my, um, my perspective of working in that space, is social workers want to spend more time with children. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They get into that job because they want to help children. And then they get into it and they realize that it's actually about filling in case notes in between car journeys. It's, mm -hmm. it's really not the job that you envisioned in the first place. So you're not actually doing what you envisioned you were doing. So somewhat, you, it's like you're working a lie to yourself. And I think there is, there is a space there um, that needs to radically change in terms of like when we're talking about things for example like um, social work is always looking for permanence for the child yeah. we see that as an mm -hmm. outcome mm -hmm. but the system is impermanent and mm -hmm. if a child was to add you on Facebook after they leave your care can you mm -hmm. or can you not <laughs> accept not. them Absolutely so not. why is it how is it permanent <laughs> yeah. why, you know, why not though yeah that's why it not? You know. um, I, I because um, because uh, that's the impression I get from exactly. other people. Yeah. Like if I was to, yeah. I would. You know what I mean? Mm. I don't know, I could, no, I just <laughs> wouldn't. Yeah, because, would say, because, yeah. because people will say things like, it, "Oh, it might be inappropriate." The same way, if a foster care, if a child mm -hmm. moves from a temporary foster placement, they, they want to stay in into a permanent one, but they want to stay with their temporary one. We have this expectation: you should just understand that's temporary, but we're looking for permanence. Well, can mm -hmm. I stay in small foster carer? No, because it might undermine the placement. There's that there's so mm. many nuances mm. in our in mm. our system that that need to really be looked at, mm. and 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 we can only really do that is if we work with young people in creative ways and to communicate how they feel, and we have strong governance in place to, to act upon what they say. You know, putting young people in the meeting and talking yeah. isn't isn't the only way that, that can happen. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's some good points there. Um, Maybe um, being live, but I don't necessarily see using creative tools as being. Oh, how can I explain it? For me, it's about having a creative mind rather than having, you know, we're going to do a bit of this kind of work mm. for it to be creative. Uh, for me, it's about the, uh, the mindset and the framework that you bring. I mean, I you I. I'm more a literature person, and mm. I, I do. I use literature a lot in my teaching, in my because to me, literature sometimes tells stories much more powerfully than a piece of research would tell you about what it feels like for a child to live with a parent who's got mental health problems. Sometimes literature, for me, gets into that emotional. Mm. So there. So for me, it's about having a creative mindset that would approach how you, uh, that would inform how you approach mm. that interaction with that child or that family, rather than, than always having to be doing something. Yeah. Does that make sense? I don't know if it that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think then organized, because you, you were saying before about kind of how you don't feel you can stay in touch with children because of the system. Or the yes, so I, I, I want to make it clear that I would happily no, no, I have them it. all as my friends. I would have yeah. my own sort of separate social space book for it if I was allowed. Yeah, no, you, il you illustrated a point wonderfully yeah. because, I mean, I don't know if Social Work England want to say whether you can or can't because I remember I, I asked the same question at the Social Work England conference as well and Social Work England from the conference that was recorded said that you can. It's up to you. Do you know what I mean? In terms of, and but the, the anxiety is, is around the team managers and other people around it in I terms of the understanding of that system but the, the point is uh, back to this is that we should openly communicate that people can use creative methods to communicate with children not just tell you have to fill in your case notes or that person has to turn that meeting we should be encouraging it openly yeah. and yeah, creating yeah. spaces within organizations where we can actually communicate once you've done that how did that go or what was that like and is it part of an issue about um t teachers maybe have experienced the same thing in the teaching sector there's a kind of rationalization the national curriculum legislation policy da, 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 has slowly driven social work into a space where it feels there's no there's no rule there's no stated mm. rule there's an ethos of caution and what we're mm. talking about here is embracing an ethos of not even creativity it's an it's an attitude of mm. agility uh, giving social workers the power to to make judgments mm. and react mm. and tap mm. into that instinct that maybe brought mm. them into the work mm. in the first place yeah. Yeah. Can and I you ask went to oh which you used the word permission earlier and just picking up what you're both saying. It's, 
you know, I as a leader of, of that need to make that explicit that this is mm. okay. I need to be the champion of creative mm. work mm. and, you know, going to the museum for three hours, of course, if mm. that's going to mean <laughs> something <laughs> to that kid. <laughs> <laughs> but do I want you to make sure that you've got your court statement ready so the judge doesn't <laughs> get cross? <laughs> yes, I need you to do that too. So <laughs> it's, it's, you know, we have to give, uh, it's got to come from me as a leader, mm. Councillor Ashraf mm. as, as our deputy our councillor mm -hmm. Warby, our lead member, you know, my boss, we, it comes from the top, from universities instilling in workers that yes, it's going to be tough out there, mm -hmm. you're going to have deadlines, you're going to have expectations of everyone, it's going to feel constricted, but don't forget why you're in the business, don't forget mm -hmm. what you're there to do, and what you're there to do is to, to help children tell their stories, mm -hmm. so you really get it, mm -hmm. and you get their family's business, so you can best help them, that's the bottom, that's the main question, mm -hmm. so I think it comes from learning, inductions, when staff get mm -hmm. here, and for me as a leader to keep on, mm -hmm. you know, allowing that mm -hmm. to be, mm -hmm. um, but finding the balance because there's a reason for mm -hmm. regulations. Mm -hmm. It keeps it safe, and it ultimately regulations keep children safe as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's that balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and we'll, we'll talk about Facebook later. Okay. <laughs> 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 I, I, I still, I have contact with um, a child who I was a social worker with 30 years ago. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, 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 but that yeah. was through since he's an adult, but yes, and a couple of others. So I, I think it, it is about the relationship. So yep. it's, it's a good cha it's a good question. Yeah, and like we'll have to debate it afterwards. It comes with it comes with risks, but I think you've yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it, it's you've opened up a question mm. that we sh you know mm. we should ask. I'm I'm still in contact mm. with. She's probably about forty now. Mm. <laughs> she's um, a, a young woman I worked with, but. In, during that time, this was in the late 80s, 90s, mm. I worked with her from the age of 13 till she left eight, 18. Mm. Yeah. Hardly social workers you now. You don't do that anymore. I don't <laughs> do that anymore. So mm. I'm still in touch with her. Mm. Yeah. Um, and she told me, uh, the last time I saw her, she told me in one of the meetings I was having with her, her she had a boyfriend hiding in the wardrobe. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, it all comes so out when they are not. <laughs> but, but you illustrate a wonderful point here because like <laughs> you know no you do because i mean if you think about it as dinner time conversation you know lots of us have the privilege of going home speaking to our families around the dinner table about life before yeah. you know uh, mm -hmm. when children leave care they don't have the opportunity to do that and dinner time conversation has usually been a professional review so there, there is something so pointant about what you said of being able to go over these memories and laugh and joke yeah. about them yeah, yeah. You know, it's a really yeah. good yeah. point yeah. really good <laughs> so we've got a, c a few minutes until hopefully we look at some questions and comments from the people out there. Um, just wanted to ask you just finally, um, in an attempt to bring us to a nice, uh, visionary, positive space, just thinking about, if we think about this as a, a creative attitude, as opposed to a creative social work approach, yeah? So just opening up a bit. Uh, and if that were to get to become fully embraced, what do we think success would look like? What, what might that achieve? Where might that get us? First and foremost, yeah. a happier workforce. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, Norma, Sarah, you'd, you, if you could get to do that and, and be free to work with this, you know, with your children and families in this way, you'd, you'd want to stay, wouldn't Definitely you? Definitely. And yeah. we have. We've seen better retention mm. since we've started embracing this way of working and stuff, mm. happier. Mm. And, and, I mean, it goes without saying what, what you'd see the outcome for the children mm. is. Mm. We, we have to describe what the child's, be able to describe a child's lived experience, actually what we will start to see is a real understanding of that child or young person's mm. lived experience because mm. we've created the, the means to for them to mm. to share mm. um, in, in a, in a non-threatening mm. sort of and, and difficult mm. way. So yeah, I, I think there's benefits for, the outcome should be a better attention and attraction of, of good staff who want mm. to be creative, but also obviously the most important mm. better for families. Mm. I think mm. also for me, success will be around having courageous conversations. Mm -hmm. It's an environment that was open mm. enough for conversations to take place mm. because often the sort of solutions and the sort of issues that are need to be addressed, y you're not looking to have, you know, a checklist, so this should happen, no, this should happen. But it's about the conversations um, that people need to have, the risky conversations, mm. 
to ask the mm -hmm. challenging questions. Mm -hmm. um, and that to me is when you've got an environment where that convers those conversations can take place, that to me is a sign of success mm. yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, oh, sorry. I was just, I would like an outcome to be um, like sort of one if this approach of social work is embedded and became the norm over like, um, I don't know, like over a decade or two decades for social work as a whole to be seen in society mm. and in the media mm. as mm. Um, what it actually is, like a, a place of support and community and love, you know, like yeah. I don't know, that's how mm. I see yeah. social yeah. work and mm. I feel like that's not the impression that, you know, EastEnders, oh my goodness, like they completely <laughs> ruined everything for us. So I'd quite like the idea of that being an outcome, well. a mm. long-term mm -hmm. outcome, yeah. Mm. I think on the floor, on the ground, we might see um, more uh, uh, physical spaces, environmental changes. Um, April and I were speaking about this prior, um, that, that, th that the environment really does make a difference and it shows where our priorities are, it shows where we want to focus when we, the environment reflects um, nurture and um, a space for creativity um, to be disruptively, um, hopefully disruptive. Um, you know, when, when we've got young people or, or vulnerable adults um, having to access spaces that look like they may have been arrested or um, <laughs> they're going to go into a meeting, mm -hmm. it, that doesn't lend itself to, um, to a creative process. So I think... Um, that would be, that would be really um, mm. good for me to start seeing those spaces mm. um, that actually are social work spaces, mm. but that lend themselves to what we want to stand for and what we want to create. Mm. 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 Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's that kind of tying of, I mean, think of coming back locally, thinking about the art space and the social work space being community spaces mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and coming together and building on that community conversation, communication. And of course, there is a place for processes, of course there is, but there is a place beyond process too. Mm. Mm. I, I, think, I, think, I think one of the things, I mean, we look at young people's success, education, employment, training, stability, maybe artistic potential is something that we need mm. to include in there. Because if I'm saying to social workers, what is this young person's artistic potential? Mm. I'm indirectly telling you to go and do creative mm. things with them to figure that out. Right. Mm. So you're feeling empowered to actually explore artistic potential with this young person and finding mechanisms to be creative. So yeah. it kind of yeah. just becomes mm. the norm. And I yeah. think mm -hmm. from that, then you're challenging another thing there, which is around like, you know, how many, how many people have been brought up, uh, have become artists, have been told, don't do art, that's a silly thing, go and do a proper job. You know, you're actually <laughs> challenging something bigger in society there as yeah, well. Yeah. Mm. I think that's such a good example. Mm. And we've just had um, at my youth that's offending cool. board, um, a group of young people at one of our local schools, Joe Richardson, um, doing some clean drill. Mm. And, you know, cool. these are young lads who just, <laughs> you know, mumble, mumble. <laughs> and there they are, like, is it rapping or doing drill, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. whatever it's called. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and amazing. And this and poets, mm. that it was they just are, pure yeah. poetry. Mm. Mm. Um, but And that was, I think, you know, I like to believe, and it was work done by our youth at risk um, team, Matrix team. But I think that was an extension of the work that Newtown culture has brought to the table mm. and that creative, you know, way of working, working with artists and that hopeful disruption mm. and with the most hard to reach young people. Mm. It was beautiful mm. to see and the, the, the teacher came afterwards and she was so excited. <laughs> she says, these kids are bouncing. They are yeah. just feeling so good and, you know, because they, they see themselves on camera, they can hear mm. and it's positive. Mm. It's not the negative side of drill music. It's positive. Mm. So, yeah. So mm. I think mm. we're going to open up for some mm. questions. I just wanted to say that for me, there's the, I'd just like to put that focus back on the role of art and artists and mm -hmm. culture mm -hmm. um, in, in the, the, the public s in public services, in the space of public services, because mm. there is a massive instinct, there's a massive momentum within 
the, the art world amongst artists mm. to engage with people and to support social change. But th there isn't necessarily that conversation. There's a real lack of confidence and hesitancy about that, that mm. conversation. Mm. So I hope that as social workers build their confidence to work in creative ways, that that conversation starts to open up more. Mm. Um, okay, so have we actually got any questions? <laughs> Yep, we have a few that have come through. I'm not sure we'll get through all of them. Um, okay. First one, people say we used to do more adventurous work with our service users. This became less and less possible with new statutory restrictions and high caseloads. What went wrong? <coughs> How do we get back there? And can we improve what used to happen? So, big question. <laughs> so, so, basically, tapping into the idea that things have got more transactional, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to pick up on that? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <Big question. laughs> uh, yeah, what went wrong? Um, <laughs> but actually, we, we're assuming that things were better mm. back then. You know, I, I'm sure if I went back and looked at some of the case files where, you know, I was a social worker, you know, they it won't necessarily be better. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. thing of permanence, we weren't achieving permanence for our children right. in good time. We weren't sort of, you know, sort of protecting them in a timely way. You know, so I, I think we, we must hold on to the fact that some of this process and, and you know, regulation mm -hmm. and us being held accountable is for all the right reasons. It's driven by, you know, children being safer and families mm -hmm. being together. So where it's safe to do so. So I don't want to sort of go in b the good old days, mm -hmm. although being an old social worker, I, I can't find myself doing that. <laughs> but I, I think um, there is no doubt um, it's tough mm -hmm. at the moment to, to do this mm -hmm. kind of creative work. Um, and have that three hours at a museum <laughs> with caseloads. You know, <laughs> our caseloads, <laughs> lots of boroughs are really struggling with mm. the demand um, and, you know, budgets are, are, are tight. You yep. know, there's, there's only so much to go around mm. when you're in a borough where there's such high level need. And as much as, you know, we, we are talk about wanting to, you know, this must be a, a way of being for all my, my social workers and my youth offending workers and child practitioners. Um, acutely conscious that caseloads and capacity of their time gets in the way. I know the hours my staff do, I know the hours I work. We mm. all go over and above, it's the nature of the job. However, um, we can only, uh, you know, be at a higher level, be tackling some of those financial issues, those financial decisions, making sure that, you know, like you said earlier, Sarah, if you don't have the you know, the capacity to do that piece of work, you can tap into that artist who can, or you can yeah. tap into that mm. youth worker who can perhaps do that. So it's team around the child, as you said mm. earlier, Marley. We've got to be creative and have new networks. Mm. Our network is no longer just the health visitor, the police and the school. Yeah. Mm. Our network mm. is much wider than Absolutely. that. We've got to capitalize on that. We're doing it with our contextual safeguarding, and I think we should do it with every child. So yeah, yeah caseloads are not going to go down overnight because mm. the need is so high. Mm. Money is not going to go away as a problem, mm. but we can do other things that can try and make it easier and be, sup you know, make sure so social workers are getting good supervision and good support. Mm. You know, that intervision, intervision mm. that you, yeah, mm. Molly and he was with my leadership team at the Tate the other day, you know, and we did this intervision sort of group supervision. It was fantastic, a way of being feeling supported and solving problems together, we've mm. got to give mm. that to workers too, because then that, that helps you survive yeah. those mm. tough times of caseloads mm. and time scales, etc. There's, there's two things, isn't there? There's like the, I suppose what we're measuring is better before, because we, you know, we know that since 2010, 20 percent increase of young people come into care. But but also, depending on how far back we go, what we would have considered abuse of children is different. You know, mm. there was lots yeah. of young mm -hmm. people that should have come into care mm. yeah. because mm. our idea of abuse now has has, has changed. Um, so inevitably, we've got more young people come into care because more young people need to be in care, need to be looked after. Um, so I suppose the question is, isn't it, is around how do we relinquish control and how do we delegate authority to other people around that young person to yeah. be able to work in these creative ways, which mm -hmm. is some of the work of the Foster Network have done with mm -hmm. foster carers, for Absolutely. example. So, yeah. And how do we give social workers confidence to be able to give that control and that power away to other people so that you feel supported? Because mm. you know, ultimately you're responsible as no. the social worker, which no. is the biggest yeah. fear. So how do we create a culture of, 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 of disseminating some of that power and dissolving some of that power to other people around mm -hmm. 
the child so that they feel confident to do it because we mm -hmm. can give it away but it's also the the culture and the communication behind it that needs to enable people to feel confident to take that power mm -hmm. and, to, and to work in, in a different way with young people. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just going to add really, really quickly, I, I don't have the answers to this person about yeah. solving it, but I do think we've touched on something around retention of social workers because I think that can really help. And I do think that sometimes... Um, holding on to experienced social workers is really really mm. important mm. it's not going to reduce caseloads but i think it does help locally in terms of managing mm. some of those issues and i know you know you've spoken about some of those issues but if you've got a ha a more content workforce that mm -hmm. isn't looking for ways out all the time that will create more mm. scope within a team Absolutely, mm -hmm. I think. I, I wanted to just touch on, on Paul's work um, and some of the ingredients that work for us in Paul's are having the luxury of being able to have very low um, protected caseloads. So we get that time with women and, and that focus is on um, breaking some of those cycles for women. Mm. Um, and, and those are some of the ingredients that do work, having that time to spend with that person, having <coughs> that time to um, create spaces um, that that person is able to not only express themselves, but as um, we were talking about, come into with a creative mindset um, in, in trying new things. Um, and breaking cycles that perhaps have been repeated and haven't worked in the past. Um, having, um, and I feel almost bad saying that after we're talking about the really high <laughs> caseload of um, children's social mm. workers at the moment, but, but that those things really do, that particularly um, Barking and Dagenham have a service like Pause um, for some of our most mm. vulnerable women in our borough is really powerful that that some of us are able to to yeah. give that time mm. so just on the back of that i think we should communicate that elephant in the room that based on your evidence-based approach of lower case loads enabling better work that, that we need more funding from government mm. to ensure we can employ more social workers to do this important work I think that's an obvious thing that we can say mm -hmm. as a solution, mm -hmm. maybe somewhat controversial, so I feel probably no, the most qualified no, to say it. Social, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't, social work doesn't exist outside of, you know, it doesn't exist in isolation mm. from politics and society mm. and austerity mm. and all mm. those things. It, doesn't, it hasn't had like the special badge, like, oh, okay, mm. we'll just keep funding you the same as we always have. And okay. Like, it just, it's, it's the same. Mm. It's the same. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit of your why, a little bit, mm. not going too deep into there, but... Yeah. Mm. So have we got time for one more question? Have you got <laughs> one more? One more. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks for such a brilliant and thoughtful discussion. If you wanted to achieve some of your outcomes and s or successes, who and what do you need to make them a reality? What is that first step? Mm. Wow. Mm. So, hmm. I think we've made the first step, haven't we? I was going to say things like this, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't yeah. It's defining. Isn't it the networks? Isn't it this? It's coming together and talking through, realizing you're not alone, we're not alone. Mm -hmm. There are common, mm -hmm. and that's where you get power in numbers mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about big chairs and official things telling us what to do. It's about us saying these are re the realities. Mm -hmm. I suppose ultimately. Um, the big chairs do come into it. Well, we need more money. That's mm. something we c you can also <laughs> say. It's partly well about that alliance, isn't it? Because social care is lacking in resources, as is the culture sector. But there's something about... So at the moment, Newtown Culture is partly funded through cultural funding. It's partly funded through... So that, that there's an alliance represented in the way the funding works for Newtown Culture. Mm. So there's... And, and I think... So there's a... There's a, there's a political case, a policy case to be made for this kind of work. It mm. needs to go mm. filter all the way up. And fortunately, we're work doing this in a borough that has an ear for that. And so we're really mm. working. But I suppose, what do you think about how the way we're working here maybe transfers into other local authorities? That's mm. another question, isn't it? Yeah, mm. I mean, just to finish up on the point of ours, yes, I think we, we're well off first base, and the mm. fact we're here today and we, you know, publicising it, that, that's 
that's us sort of owning it and mm. I'll have to put my money here. <laughs> we'll have to put our money where our mouth is and, <laughs> you know, keep on doing the doing. Otherwise, people are going to say, well, I heard you on that <laughs> podcast. You, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I've come started here and there's no such thing. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> we have to keep on going. But, um, but also because we, you know, passionately believe in it. Mm. I think the important thing that we have to do is... And this links to the money issue is is be able to evidence those outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, you know that we've got a really strong outcomes framework, and we've got a way of measuring the impact for our children mm -hmm. and our families. Because that's when, when you go to the big chairs mm -hmm. and ask for the money, it's all about that. Mm -hmm. How is this? benefited us so how many more staff have you mm. retained how many more children have you achieved permanence mm. how many children you know that are safer that's what we've got to really nail mm. Mm. in order to yeah. kind of keep it and going maybe as also well trying to twist slightly or, or, or open ways of thinking about how that is evidence so that mm. it can become qualitative mm. Mm. yeah not just quantitative Absolutely. no mm. uh, both yeah i'd say both because you know sometimes numbers is is what you know chairs yeah. <laughs> need because <laughs> that's tangible um, but that quality of stuff mm. without a saying you know to get a child in a room and to tell their story ev mm. it works every time mm. because mm. you know or, or to get a video or to get quotes yeah. we absolutely I, I think you're right and I was just thinking that it's also mm. about pushing it's not just about young people and, and it's how you go through into adulthood because imagination mm. is all about being able to think about mm. future possibilities or other mm. possibilities it's about choices that you can make without knowing that there are, or having the openness to, mm. or the help to know there are different possibilities in any life decision mm. people make, women make, young people, mm. as adults we make, having that yeah. imagination, mm. it's, mm. it's bigger than, than just this sector, it's bigger than, it's a yeah. So yeah. societal mm. help. Mm. Mm. Which mm. takes us on to the regional bit, which you were asking, Marake, mm. is how do we, you know, how does this get out to other authorities? Mm. You know, social workers move around, you know, so they would go to another borough and they would talk about this, mm. Mm. and you know, or I meet with all my sort of east, north east London um, equivalents. We t we share, we share ideas, we share things. When we advertising for a post, we might name we are you know in our mm. new campaign. Mm. We're going to be boasting about mm. this because we think it's fantastic. We're yeah. proud of it. Mm. So that you know, others will hear that, and and boroughs are competitive. They'll go, mm. well, they've got that. Yeah. We yeah. need to look mm. into that, and then it, it and so sows the seed of people you know we learn from each other and we always horizon gazing seeing what others are doing and if it's good and it's good for our kids we want to nab that and try it out ourselves mm. so i think that, that it will happen mm. um i'll certainly you know again we'll be out there talking about our social workers who move around or or meet other social workers mm. talk about it linkedin all that and i think one of the yeah. things that's really struck me whilst working on newtown culture is just the huge amount of expertise that exists within your social worker staff, mm. but also the rel relatively few opportunities they have to speak in public situations mm. like this and to share their experience mm. and mm. their expertise. Mm. And um, that's not true in other fields, I don't think. Mm. That, that mm. And there's uh, the risk of over-romanticizing them, unsung heroes in lots of ways. And I think things like our podcast, but also creating a platform for social workers to share their experience, their, sorry, their expertise with each other, mm. Mm. rather than it becoming another initiative that's being rolled out at mm. them, I suppose. Mm. I think sure. that's really yeah, important. That's mm. So, how are we doing? I think, I think we have to end now. It's <laughs> been such yeah, a no. wonderful conversation. Thanks, yeah. everybody, Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mm. And over to you, Anne-Marie, for the... Yeah, so many thanks to everyone for joining us today. You'll be able to watch the live stream back on our website, so do check into our website. It's www.newtownculture.org. <laughs> and thank you so much to our panelists um, for joining us today. As you pointed out, it feels very much like this is the first step, and we're on to something incredibly important and exciting. Yeah. Um, so do check all of our tools and resources on the website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. <laughs> 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 <laughs>